Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's webinar on managing dementia, anxiety, and depression. I'm Janine Grossman, Director of Professional Services at Montefiore. Before we commence, I'd like to show my respect and acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land of elders past and present on which this meeting takes place. We are thrilled that we have over 300 people registered for tonight's event. The Montefiore Spotlight Series discusses perspectives on aging and addresses the issues that affect older members of the community and their loved ones. Each session will explore an aspect of the aging experience, including health and wellness, research and innovation, making the right choices in aged care, and supporting older family and community members. You'll have the opportunity to hear from visiting experts and our own Montefiore professionals in a clinical and allied health care. This evening, we welcome Sienta Professor Henry Bradati, clinical psychologist Melissa Le Levi, and Montefiore senior dementia consultant Elizabeth Baum as our experts and special guests. Henry is a researcher, clinician, policy advisor, and strong advocate for people with dementia and their carers. At UNSW Sydney, he is Sienta Professor of Aging and Mental Health, co-director of the Center for Health, Healthy Brain Aging, and director, Dementia Center for Research Collaboration. He has over 500 publications in refereed journals, is a senior psychogeriatrician. He was previously president of International Psychogeriatric Association, chairman of Alzheimer's Disease International, and president of Alzheimer's Australia, New South Wales, and Australia. He is an officer of the Order of Australia and a Ryman Prize winner. Henry is also the chair of Montefiore Clinical Advisory Committee. Over a decade ago, Melissa Levi embarked on her career as a clinical psychologist, specializing in older people's mental health and dementia. She is committed to educating and empowering families to better understand aging, have the big conversations and plan for the future so they can take control of their aging journeys. Her, in, her mission inspired her upcoming book, We Need to Talk About Aging, and her website, Talking Aging, resources she wishes she had been, she wished had been available for her own family when her grandfather was diagnosed with dementia. Elizabeth Baum is Montefiore's senior dementia consultant. She is an occupational therapist with expertise in dementia, aged care, and older people's mental health. Eliza is passionate about evidence-based care and understanding the person's perspective in assessing and supporting responsive behaviors. She believes the cornerstone to best practice in aged care is a cohesive and collaborative multidisciplinary team alongside family and carers to support our residents. I will now hand over to Henry, who will talk about what's new in dementia prevention, new treatments in development of Alzheimer's, and how to live positively, positively with dementia. Thanks, Henry. Thanks very much, Janine, and it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, let me just share my screen. <clears throat> so are you able to see my screen? Someone? Yes. Um, good, thank you. So you've heard what I'm going to talk about, and it's a real pleasure to be here, and it's an honor to be here. I, I've been associated with the Monty for many years. I'm an ambassador for the Monty, as well as chairing the Clinical Advisory Committee.
So we know there are a lot of people with dementia. The numbers sort of roll over the head, but recent report, almost half a million people with dementia in Australia. The numbers are set to grow because we're an aging society. The cost is enormous, 1% of our gross domestic product in 2018 dollars. And um, you add to that the number of people caring for someone with dementia and those with pre-dementia having some cognitive problems but functioning normally. So what's new? Let's start with what's new in prevention. We've known now that there are a large number, 12 environmental factors, which account for 40% of the risk for dementia. That's all dementias. And uh, what are these 12 factors? Because they're things we can do something about. In early life, the major factor is low education. In midlife, hearing loss, traumatic brain injury, blood pressure, high blood pressure that is, drinking more than three standard drinks a day on the average, obesity, and in late life, you can read the other ones, depression, smoking, depression, social isolation, physical inactivity, air pollution, and diabetes. Now, these percentages are the percentages contributing to that 40%. And I just want a word of caution. Let me tell you, there's a difference between relative risk and absolute risk. Let me tell you, there's a drug that could reduce the cancer incidence by 50%. You say, that's fantastic. But then I tell you, it reduces the incidence from two per thousand to one per thousand. The absolute risk is a much more useful of communicating the true impact. Yet the media sensationalize things. They'll report the 50%, but not the 0.1% in difference in the absolute risk. So let me drill down to some of these factors. Exercise. It seems that exercise is protective and throughout the lifespan, and not just aerobic exercise, but resistance training as well. Probably more evidence for resistance training. Does crosswords work? Well, I don't know. But certainly stimulating your brain, stretching your brain, perhaps learning a musical instrument, or doing some of these computer cognitive training courses uh, may actually have some benefit. Yes, but only in midlife is obesity a risk factor. If you get past, say, 70 or 75, it ceases to be a risk factor. In one study, it was protective. Um, bring on the strudel. The key things about the diet are the Mediterranean-style diet, rich in fruit, vegetables, grains, nuts, smaller amounts of fish and seafood, um, and dairy, and really only modest amounts of red meat and sweets. About a third of our diet, no more than a third should be fat, and less than 8% should be saturated fat. Recently, hearing loss has been associated with dementia. That's very worrying, because a third of older people will have hearing problems. The good news is that people who wear hearing aids seem to ameliorate that risk. People who are socially isolated have a higher rate of dementia. People who are lonely have poorer health in many ways. The causation can go both ways. That poor health can cause, cause social isolation as well. But it seems to be a fairly robust connection. So keeping socially connected, as well as keeping your mind active and your body active, are really important, as is sleep. Sleep is where we clear the toxic proteins out of our brain. And people who sleep less than, say, seven hours or more than nine hours have a higher rate of dementia. Again, people who may be developing dementia may have problems with their sleep as a result. There's recent evidence about air pollution. This is exposure to particulate matter, nitrous oxide, and carbon monoxide. This is a picture from a National Geographic magazine. Now, we're, most of us living in, in the eastern suburbs are pretty immune from this air pollution, but there are some areas where, in fact, it's much more of a problem. 
Now, I haven't gone through all the risk factors. I've only got 20 minutes. Doesn't mean if you avoid all these risk factors, you won't get dementia. It may delay the onset. And because dementia is a disease of late life, just delaying it by five years could reduce the worldwide prevalence from 50 million to 25 million. The message is it's never too late to look after yourself, to exercise regularly, at least half an hour a day, five days a week, an hour a day even better, eat well, socialize, keep your brain active, and uh, look after those other issues like high blood pressure and diabetes. Don't smoke and don't drink alcohol to excess. Let me turn to treatment. And when people talk about treating dementia, they ask me whenever I go out, Henry, has there been a breakthrough? What they mean is there been a silver bullet, a drug. Well, no. There are drugs for Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's, by the way, is the most common type of dementia. It accounts for over 50% of cases. Now, all these drugs have been around for over 20 years, but they're very modest in their effect. They may stabilize the person or de decline at a slower rate. They don't treat the underlying pathology that's happening in the brain. What's been happening in the last few years has been a huge number of studies looking at antibodies to the toxic protein that builds up in the brain called the amyloid beta protein or the A beta protein. And in, two, in 2021, the FDA in the States approved the top one, aducanumab. Everything in AB is an antibody. And M is monoclonal antibody. And the other two drugs, donanumab, have had some positive results. And gantanarumab had negative results in a recent trial. But the other trials are underway. The big news happened on November the 29th last year at a conference and simultaneously in the New England Journal of Medicine, the results for lecanemab, a drug led by uh, Biogen and ASI were released. It was an 18 month trial. And it's the first disease modifying drug to show a, an effect on the primary outcome. And you see the two lines in the graph. The upper line are people on the placebo, uh, the, sorry, the blue line are people on placebo, the lower line, and the upper line are people on the drug. And the rate of decline is faster in the people on placebo. So over 18 months, there was a 27% reduction in decline, equivalent to being five months ahead of the people on placebo. Now, caveats. There, there was a lot less amyloid, this toxic protein in the brain, on these specialized brain scans. But one in eight people had adverse effects, swelling of the brain and micro hemorrhages. Mostly these were benign and settled with time. It's costly, as you can see, and it requires an intravenous infusion every two weeks. This year, it received accelerated approval in the US. There's an application in with the TGA in Australia, and we'll see. So where to next in drug treatment? Everyone declined, even the people on the drug. There is no silver bullet for Alzheimer's, not yet anyway. None of these is a cure. And maybe those lines that we saw going down at different rates, maybe it'll diverge over time and it'll even be a greater effect, or maybe the reverse, we don't know. The hope is that maybe treating people before they get symptoms, because we can now identify Alzheimer's pathology in the brain before you have dementia symptoms. There are drug trials in progress. If you want to find the drug trial, Google Alzheimer's drug trial Sydney, you'll find some. Other dementias, which I've mentioned there, are not getting as much attention. Vascular dementia, the second most common cause, may be treated by looking at the vascular risk factors, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes. The last part of my talk is on managing dementia. You know, people get a diagnosis. 
and then they're lost. They feel they don't know what's going to happen next. The carers feel that all the responsibility is on them. They feel burdened. They feel a blame. The person might feel anger, might feel grief. It's a very difficult time. And often there's a lack of support after diagnosis. It's an area I've been focusing on with others, on post-diagnostic support. There are so many issues. Work. I saw a doctor yesterday who um, has had to give up work because of Alzheimer's. He doesn't want to give up work. I saw a man today who's driving, and I've told him he has to stop driving or have a driving assessment. Arranging legal issues, financial management. Do I tell my family? Do I tell our friends? Oh, if I tell my friends, it'll, they'll stay away. It's such a stigma with it. This whole issue of communication and destigmatizing it and bringing it out into the open, like we did with cancer 30 years ago. There's so much we can do for people with dementia to live positively. Here are some of the things. I won't dwell on this because we haven't got time, but I'll go through some of the issues. And I have evidence for all of this, but I won't have time to show you. They'll be on my hidden slides if we ever uh, can get those to you. So cognitive training. These are mainly on computers. And there's a small to moderate effect. Things like uh, Brain HQ or Neuronation. There's quite a few. Uh, and they're all commercial. They don't <coughs> have transfer beyond the immediate training task as much as we'd like, excuse me. Here are some, some of the companies that have programmed <laughs> that have been recommended by my neuropsychology colleagues. About me. <laughs> Cognitive stimulation therapy. No, just take a cough, Lolly. I've, I've had this cold for about two weeks now. Getting better. It's a post-viral cough. <coughs> so this is usually in small groups where you target thinking and concentration. People with mild to moderate dementia, usually a couple of times a week over seven weeks. It's recommended in the UK by the NICE guidelines, National Institute of Clinical Excellence. It's hard to find. Fortunately, at War Memorial Hospital, they have a very good program called iReady. And so there's a waiting list, but you can contact them if you're interested in that and have early dementia. Cognitive rehabilitation is more of what Eliza might be interested in and, and does well. It's about getting people to do things they're unable to do because of their cognitive impairment. They set the goals. It could be using their email to keep in contact. It could be feeling confident to go out or cook a meal or dress oneself. It's enabling participation in activities that are relevant to that person. There are many occupational therapy interventions and people like Eliza are expert in these. And I often use a private OT to help with the management of my patients. And she does a fantastic job. How do you find an OT? Your GP can refer for six sessions on a chronic disease management plan. You may be able to get one through your home care package. You can find an OT online. And here are some uh, options. Physical exercise is not only good for preventing dementia, it's good for slowing dementia. And as I said, the mixture of exercises is really important. Not just going for a walk with your friend. Um, shopping is not exercise. You really have to get puffed and uh, sweaty. How do you do it? There are some seniors clubs around. Some of the gyms have special times for elders. Um, there's a falls prevention program at Prince of Wales Hospital, and I think at War Memorial Hospital as well. War Memorial Hospital has a great program, but it's a long wait uh, to get onto that program. And there are other places around which to provide exercise. I really recommend it. Talking therapies are more important for people with depression or anxiety. We're going to hear about that from Melissa Levi. So here's a review of cognitive behaviour therapy for people with dementia. Yes, 
mild dementia, showing it can reduce depression and anxiety symptoms. How do you access it? Again, your GP can refer the person for a mental health plan. Also, there's post-diagnostic support counselling available through Dementia Australia. Three month wait. My point is there's much to be offered beyond the diagnosis and prescription. There's a partnership between the patient, the family, the GP and services. Our aim with Forward with Dementia is to empower the patient and family to take control of the dementia. It's also good for doctors too. So this is the website, forwardwithdementia.org.au. It's something we developed. It's a, a study funded by the EU and the NHMRC and with five countries. Um, and we see there's a portal here for people with dementia, for family carers and for healthcare practitioners. Anyone can go to anywhere. It has lots of good information. Um, the resources were developed with people with dementia, with carers and health professionals. So we've had wonderful feedback about this. It's really useful. Um, there's stories from people, there's strategies on how to cope with different problems. There's checklists, there's planning guides, there's webinars, there's a regular newsletter. So that's the website, that's the Twitter handle, and you can, uh, if you uh, QR code that, you can get to it as well. So I'd like to thank you all for your attention. How am I going for time? Yeah, and, um, oh, I'm finishing early actually. <laughs> okay, great. And that'll give us more time for, uh, for questions. So uh, apologies if it's a bit rushed, but I what I wanted to, to emphasize is there's a lot we can do throughout our life lifetime to delay the onset of dementia. There's no golden prevention, but we can delay the onset. And, and ideally we can delay till after we die. There are drugs available and lots of trials. There's no silver bullet yet, but there is some hope with these new antibodies, particularly for Alzheimer's. But we can do other things like managing our vascular risk factors. And finally, if you do have dementia or someone in your family has dementia, it's not the end, it's the beginning. It's a new journey. People can live positively. People can have very good quality of life. They can have love from the people they love. They can give love. They can enjoy their game of tennis, their music, their walk at the beach, their coffee with friends, going to galleries, going to watch football games. They can do those things and still enjoy them. Just because your memory is impaired doesn't mean you're demented, full stop. This is a slow process. Thank you very much. And I'll pass back to Janine. Oh, to Eliza, sorry, Eliza. Thank you so much, Henry. That was incredible. And I just love the hopeful message that you signed off with at the end there. Um, there's a question that's actually come through. And the question is, what is the overlap between dementia, depression and anxiety? And why do they present in a similar way? It's a very complicated question and, and a good one, but thank you. So there is a link between depression and dementia, as I mentioned. So people who are depressed in late life are more likely to develop dementia. It may be that they have dementia already developing and that's what leads to the depression. So it's something called reverse causality. There's also a complication. People developing dementia or even at risk of dementia become more apathetic. They lose interest. They don't engage in their hobbies. And one of the biggest issues I see is people are sent to me for treatment of depression and they're not sad. They're not crying. They've lost interest. They've lost their get up and go. They've lost initiative. They have apathy. And that's associated with damage to the frontal parts of the brain or pathology growing up, uh, developing there. So that's another connection. Anxiety also has a link with dementia. So imagine you got the diagnosis, you might get depressed and you certainly may be anxious about the future. You might be anxious about what's going to happen to me. Um, will it pass on to my children? Will they get it as well? There are a lot of things people feel anxious about. Most people feel anxious about loss of autonomy and loss of independence. And so, but even apart from that, anxiety has been linked to an increased risk of dementia as well. 
the, the percentage increase is small. It's bigger with depression, but again, it may be because of reverse causality. And because a person has dementia doesn't mean we can't treat the anxiety and depression. We're going to hear about that from Mel in a few minutes. Um, and we just need to tackle each of those separately and think about holistically. What's causing this depression and anxiety? Is it a reaction to the diagnosis or the possibility? Is it problems because relationships have fallen apart? Like a patient I saw today, um, his wife left him and the children are trying to help support him and they're fighting with each other. Is it because of the changes in the brain itself? And so on. So it's, it's complicated. People need to see their GP to get some advice about this. If necessary, they can get referred to a specialist like a psychogeriatrician such as myself or a clinical psychologist such as Mel. Great answer. Thank you, Henry. And I think, you know, in terms of, you know, we have an aging population, being health literate when it comes to these matters is so important. So like Henry said, just to reiterate, if you have any concerns, you really need to get, you, get to your GP in the first instance because it could be a number of things. And identifying that will determine the treatment. Well, segueing into what we actually offer at Monty, it was great to see some of the things that you covered in terms of modifier lifestyle risk factors and some of the ways to slow um, dementia. Um, so some of the things that we offer at Monty, um, so basically we've got two on-staff dementia specialists, including myself, which is really a unique offering. Um, so both Amy Sander and I, we're OT trained. Um, and obviously we're gonna plug the fact that we have occupational therapists on site as well, which are incredibly proud of because as Henry said before, OTs are specialized at optimizing function at any stage in a person's diagnosis of living with dementia. Um, and a good OT can get you to achieve amazing goals. So it's always good to link in. And I really appreciate, Henry, how you put in um, some ideas on how to access an occupational therapist as well. Thank you for that. The other thing that we offer at Monty is physiotherapists and exercise physiologists. So we have them on staff and they, they're able to design individualized programs for our residents and support their independent choice and support their physical and mental well-being. So we have um, from land to water-based exercises and um, strength training as well. We have social groups and communal eating to promote social connectedness. We've got activity groups from bus outings to hula making, which is my favourite, music, cooking, etc. Um, we offer good person-centred care, strength-based assessment, which really falls in line with what we offer um, in terms of the interdisciplinary team. So pulling all of those resources together, it's a great way to optimise health outcomes and also to make sure that someone is reaching their potential. We also have our dementia model in the Randwick Special Care Unit. This was developed by Dr. Jacqueline Wesson and Janine Grossman. Um, and this is something that promotes well-being, purpose and a sense of belonging and is successful. Um, and just on a note on home care, we now also have a staffed OT, which is fantastic. So home care can support someone living at home, um, living with dementia. And in terms of support services externally, I just want to touch on the fact that Dementia Australia do offer, like Henry said, the free counselling services and support groups. And I absolutely recommend um, calling them up and linking yourself in because I think it's just so important to be with like-minded people who can share the same experience that you or a family member are going through, whether you're a person diagnosed with dementia or whether you're a carer. It's just so important to have that social connectedness. Um, the other thing is Dementia Support Australia, they offer free advice and strategies on management in regards to changed and responsive behaviours. So if you're concerned about a loved one and some of the behaviours that they are expressing, you can give Dementia Support Australia a call and speak to a dementia consultant. They can advise you on a way to go forward, what might be happening and some strategies to put in place. Thank you so much for that, Henry. Really appreciate it. I'm sure we'll circle back to you soon with some more questions, but I might hand you over to the lovely Melissa Levi. Yeah. Um, uh, Janine, was, were you going to introduce? Yeah, but I was just going to um, give an overview of what Melissa will be covering. So um, Melissa will discuss how to ident identify late life depression and anxiety in your loved in yourself or your loved one, where to go for help and what treatments are available, 
and how to prevent depression and anxiety. So thank you, Melissa. We look forward to hearing all about that. Thank you, Janine. I'm just going to share my screen now. Bear with me. Technology is not my forte. Okay. How have I done? Can everybody see my screen? Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Thanks, Henry. Thumbs up. Um, so hi, everyone. I am just delighted to be here um, this evening with you. Um, over a decade ago now, um, two really significant things happened in my life. The first was that I went to St. Vincent's Hospital Older People's Mental Health Service looking for a job. Um, and it turns out I found a life's calling. And my grandfather, my Zeta, was diagnosed with dementia. And what I've come to know personally and professionally is that with the right education, we have the power to change the way we and our loved ones age for the better. And I'm really on a mission to try to empower other families with the resources and education that I so wish we had had um, so that we can navigate the aging journey with confidence. And that is why we are here tonight. So I want to... Let me see if I can flick my slide. Here we go. That's better. Oops. Here we go. Um, so tonight, look, as Henry said, we're a little bit limited with time, but I just want to give you an overview of late life depression and anxiety, and I'm going to try to keep it super practical. So what I'd love is for you to go away from this session, being able to identify signs and symptoms of possible depression and anxiety in your aging loved ones or even in yourself know where you can go for help, and also to feel hopeful because these conditions are absolutely treatable. And I'm also going to touch on prevention. So first, I'd like to share um, a client story with you, and I hope you don't mind. This was uh, an 84-year-old Hungarian Jewish lady who was just very dear to me. She reminded me of my own grandmother. So with your permission, um, I'm going to speak the way that she spoke. Um, it brings me, it's, it's quite, I'm quite fond um, of it. it. It's very special to me. Um, so basically, Agi um, presented to her GP with her husband's encouragement in the context of some recent weight loss and fatigue. But when the GP medically investigated, nothing came back. And so that's how Agi ended up coming my way. And when I first called her um, and mentioned who I was, she said to me, why is the doctor so worried? I am an old lady. I live the life of an old lady. What do you <laughs> want? And then once I convinced Agi to at least allow me to come to her home and just meet with her and assess her and explain, you know, what we do, um, she said, uh, it was, sorry, it was about 10 o'clock in the morning, I should say, and she was still in her night clothes, and you'll see why this is important. When I got there, she said, darling, I really, I am so tired. I wake up every morning, four o'clock in the morning, I can't go back to sleep. And her husband said, this is not my wife. She used to love to have the grandchildren, making cooking, going for the club with the friends. Now, nothing. No energy. She's not eating her food. Nothing. So at the end of our appointment, I said to Agi that I agreed with her GP. I didn't think that she was physically unwell, but I was concerned that she could be suffering from depression, to which, as you may imagine, she said, depression, don't be silly. So then I had this very difficult task of trying to convince an 84-year-old Hungarian Jewish woman that perhaps she might be depressed. And the reason that this is so important, as you'll see, is because I also wanted to share with her that there is very much something that we can do about it and we can enrich her quality of life. So just before I get into what I told Agi, um, I just want to bust some common myths. I guess the primary one here is that depression and anxiety are not inevitable or natural parts of getting older. As Agi said, you know, what do you expect? I'm an old lady. These are conditions that are superimposed on the aging process. And the reason that that distinction is so important is because if they're not a natural, inevitable part of aging, then we can treat them and we can, we can cure them, we can fix them. 
I also want to mention that often we think that older adults have an innate preference um, or respond better towards medication treatments rather than psychological therapy. And this isn't always the case. Um, it hasn't been my experience clinically, um, and there's certainly research to suggest that psychological therapy, as Henry said, very much has a place um, with older adults as well as medication. And we'll look at treatment in more detail shortly. So I then explained to Argy some of the symptoms of depression, and I thought what I would do this evening is rather than running through the formal diagnostic criteria, I'd love to share with you just some everyday tips and clues, things that maybe you can look out for in your loved ones or yourself that might allude to a possible diagnosis of depression. So the first one is low mood for most of the day on most days. Um, and this is more than just, you know, the ups and downs of life. This is a really pervasive decline in mood. People might show increased tearfulness, more negative patterns of thinking, um, and often specifically in older adults, and Henry, I wonder if you've seen this as well, it's um, often manifests as sort of non-specific physical health complaints as well. There's a particular pattern there that I want to touch on, and it's something called diurnal mood variation. And that's when somebody's mood is at its worst first thing in the morning, and then it gradually improves over the course of the day, and the person might even feel a bit better by mid to late afternoon. The reason that that pattern is important is that it can be um, a fairly good indicator of a more biologically driven depression, and it can be a good prognostic indicator at times for treatment with an antidepressant. Another common symptom, like Argy demonstrated, is a loss of interest or pleasure from activities and people that once brought meaning and joy. And I just wanted to share here something that I call the lipstick test. It is not scientific. It is not evidence-based. It is not diagnostic. But something that I've observed is that when I see an older woman presenting with depression, I often ask their family, does your, your mom, your wife, your granny, normally wear lipstick because one of the symptoms of depression is also that we tend to sometimes neglect our self-care and what I often find is that when people are still depressed they will come with no lipstick and when we finish treatment often I'll start to see these ladies coming back with you know beautiful shades of, of lipstick on again so it's just a little test that I have in the back of my mind. Changes in sleep are something to look out for, either difficulty falling asleep or like Argy had that early morning wakening. It's really important to be mindful of that. If you have a loved one or yourself, you're waking at four or five in the morning and can't get back to sleep, feeling quite low, um, that can also be a really good indicator for antidepressant treatment. Changes in appetite and weight, Argy presented initially with weight loss as her primary presentation. And things like sleep and weight can also give us an opportunity as family members to encourage our loved ones to go to the GP. Sometimes it's a little bit less threatening. It's a little bit easier to start the conversation focusing on physical health symptoms and then move the conversation into the more sort of psychological terrain. Things like fatigue, changes in thinking skills. So as Henry said, there's a relationship with, and it's a sort of a bi-directional relationship with depression and dementia. Um, but if you notice that somebody's concentration is impaired or they're having more lapses in short-term memory or their thinking just seems that little bit slower and it's happened at the same time and in the context of all of these other changes, it could be a symptom of depression. And research has shown that depression, and particularly if it's in later life or it's left untreated, as Henry said, is a risk factor for dementia. So by reaching out and getting help for the depression early, you could also be affording someone, you know, more protection against dementia. I just want to touch on hopelessness here because hopelessness is a key risk factor for suicide. And when we think of suicide, often we think of like the public health campaigns around youth suicide and, you know, younger men, and so rightly we should, but seldom does the image of sort of an older gentleman come to mind, and it should, because older Caucasian men, particularly if they're unmarried or widowed, and especially if they have a diagnosis of depression or other mental health condition, if they're physically unwell, 
they're actually one of the most vulnerable groups in terms of not just suicide risk, but completed suicide. So if you feel in yourself or if you've noticed in someone you love that there's a loss of hope for the future, that they feel that there's nothing to look forward to or their circumstances can't improve, please, please reach out to your GP immediately. And if you're hearing these symptoms and thinking, oh my goodness, I'm recognizing this in myself or in someone I love, I just want you to know that you are not alone and depression is a treatable condition as we will soon find out. I'm gonna shift focus slightly now um, and have a look at anxiety. So anxiety in and of itself is a natural, normal response to danger. It's a gift from our evolutionary ancestors. Um, and so in biblical times, for example, when we needed to make that matzah and run out of Egypt, we were anxious and our body was flooded with stress hormones and we were probably in the fight or flight response and this was adaptive and helpful and healthy and protective. Pathological anxiety, for want of a better term, is not qualitatively different from that sort of normal healthy anxiety. What is different is that that excessive fear, that inappropriate sort of fear gets triggered without there being sort of genuine danger or a genuine threat. And it's also incredibly distressing in that context to the individual and often affects their ability to function in their daily life. Anxiety is a bit of an umbrella term because there are a number of different anxiety disorders that sit underneath its canopy. I'm mindful of time, so I'll just touch on the two that I see most commonly in older adults. The first is generalized anxiety disorder. So this is sort of pervasive, excessive worry across a whole um, range of life domains and often accompanied by a lot of reassurance seeking. So it's sort of your, your, your mom, your dad, your granny, your grandpa sort of calling you, you know, dozens of time, times a day because they're worried about their health, your health, the news, the kids going to school, the finances, that sort of a picture. And the second anxiety disorder that I want to touch on is panic disorder, which is sort of recurrent, unexpected panic attacks. It's sort of that fight or flight response. So each anxiety diagnosis has its own signs and symptoms. I'm not going to go through the diagnostic criteria because, again, I thought maybe it would be more helpful to talk about clues. What can you look for in your loved ones or in yourself um, that may indicate the presence of anxiety specifically in later life? So the first one that I want to touch on is the presence of sort of multiple physical health complaints, particularly those that have been thoroughly investigated and don't appear to have an organic or medical cause. And this often presents as sort of non-specific and changeable complaints of pain or gastrointestinal upset or just general feelings of malaise and unwellness. There's that chronic worry and persistent reassurance seeking that we spoke about. There are changes in routine. And I just want to say this is a little bit different to depression because often people withdraw from previously valued activities or they avoid specific situations, not due to a lack of interest and their physical health or functional abilities haven't changed. There's something else that is stopping them. They want to, but they just can't. There's also changes in sleep. And unlike the early morning waking that we tend to see in depression, what I've seen more often in anxiety is sort of difficulty falling asleep. So that initial insomnia or waking in the night and really struggling to return to sleep because of overwhelming worry. Some other things to be mindful of are that people that have a previous history of an anxiety disorder earlier in life are more vulnerable to anxiety in later life. Um, as are those with sort of more anxious or neurotic um, personality traits. Um, and I also want to note here that sometimes anxiety can actually present as irritability and agitation, a restlessness that is not typical of a person's, you know, usual nature. So it's not always that sort of fear-based worry. It can also be that sort of more prickly agitation. And finally, depression and anxiety are highly comorbid. That means they commonly co-occur. So if you have depression, you are at an increased risk for anxiety, just in case one wasn't enough. 
But there is good news in all of this. And if there is only one message you take home from this presentation this evening, I want you to know that depression and anxiety in later life are treatable. So now let's look at those treatments. Psychological therapy. So when I first suggested psychological therapy to Aggie, she looked at me and she said, what? So I lie down on the couch and tell you, what am I dreaming? No, thank you. And I, I couldn't help but laugh because it's true. We have so many misconceptions and myths about what psychological therapy is. So I explained to Aggie that it is evidence based, and I think that's really important, it is evidence-based talking therapy for the treatment of mental health conditions. Research suggests, as I mentioned earlier, that psychological therapy, um, and of course evidence-based, is the first-line treatment of choice for mild to moderate depression and for anxiety. And then in more severe depression and anxiety, combining medication treatment with evidence-based psychological therapy is more effective than either treatment alone. It's quite powerful. You've probably heard of cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT. That's because it probably has the strongest evidence base, not probably, it does. It has the strongest evidence base for late life depression and anxiety specifically, but also more broadly for the treatment of depression and anxiety. And just anecdotally, I found this to be a really palatable modality with my clients because it is relatively short term, it is structured, it is goal oriented, and it's focused more on the present than the past. It basically sort of says, let me understand you know, your history so that I understand where this is coming from, but then let's focus on what are the current factors in the here and now that are keeping you stuck, that are maintaining your distress, and then let's implement practical evidence-based everyday strategies that have been shown um, to support people with your symptom profile to get better, to get well, and to build their psychological well-being. And unlike medication treatments, of course, therapy doesn't have the risk of adverse side effects, and it can also be really helpful in preventing relapse um, in future. Now, when I said, I might just before we get on to medication treatments, um, when I said this to Agi, um, she agreed and said back to me, okay, you know, she's willing to try, but she says, darling, how can somebody who is so young even understand what it is to be me at my stage in life. And I just think this is often feedback that we get. My own grandfather, my Zeta, was hesitant to engage, um, you know, in different sort of treatments and therapies as well, because it's this feeling of, you know, how can they understand? And the way that I address this with Agi, this may be helpful for, for you in speaking to your loved ones, is just to say that therapy is a dance. And Agi brought to that dance her lived experience, her wisdom, 84 years of being the expert on herself. I couldn't touch that. I couldn't come close to that. But what I brought to the dance was specialist knowledge and skills and evidence-based treatments that have been shown to help people such as Agi live a better quality of life and get better. And I said, Agi, if we dance well together, you will get well. And if we don't, you can find another dance partner. And that was really helpful because she felt that she had an out, which was good. Um, Agi also saw one of our old age psychiatrists, so like Henry, um, and basically he prescribed an antidepressant. The first one didn't agree with Agi. It affected her sodium levels. So we tried another one and it was the right fit. It effectively treated her symptoms and there were no adverse side effects. And sure enough, as the weeks became months, Agi got better. She came back to her usual self. Her grandkids were coming over more often. They were staying longer. She was cooking, seeing friends. She felt more energized. Her sleep had improved. And I remember her husband saying to me, this is the real Agi. Now you will see the real Agi. And we did get to see the real Agi. I just want to briefly touch on medication treatments. So there's an enormous amount of evidence supporting the effectiveness of antidepressants in treating late life depression. One little caveat I want to give here is that often we hear positive stories about particular medications from others and clients come to me and say, you know, my best friend's taking 
Prozac or Effexor or, um, and it's just really important that the prescription of antidepressants, particularly in later life, is quite nuanced. And it's important to seek an individual assessment from your GP and even preferably an old age psychiatrist because they can account for things like dosage, medication interactions, side effects, which can differ in an older adult population. In the case of anxiety, anxiety was historically treated with a class of medications called benzodiazepines. So these are Valium, Xanax, Ativan, and so on. Um, and these are sedative medications. The problem here is that, I guess, firstly, the problem is that when you take the medication, you feel better, but it doesn't really address the underlying cause of the anxiety. The other issue is that they can be addictive and also tolerance forming. So you start by taking half a tablet, then you need one tablet, then two tablets. And to wean yourself off can be a little bit tricky. You can get unpleasant withdrawal symptoms, but they can be medicated under specialist medical supervision. Sorry, mitigated under specialist medical supervision. So please don't lose heart if you would like to come off those medications. There's certainly ways. And really encouragingly, um, there's now a lot of evidence to suggest that antidepressants are similarly effective in the treatment of late life anxiety as they you know, have been used in depression and they're a lot safer as well. So certainly there, there are effective, safe medication treatments available. Coming back to where to go for help. So the first best step, of course, is to go to your GP who may refer you on to an old age psychiatrist or psychogeriatrician as they're called, or a clinical psychologist such as myself, who you might see in private practice or you might see as part of an older people's mental health service at your local public hospital. Um, if your loved one is here at Montefiore, we have old age psychiatrists come and visit here. And we're also really fortunate to have a clinical psychologist on staff as well. I just briefly, I'm mindful of time, but I briefly want to touch on prevention. So while none of us will, will necessarily be immune to developing anxiety or depression, we know from the research that there are evidence-based lifestyle strategies to promote well-being and resilience and decrease our risk. So one of them is looking after our hearts and particularly physic, uh, physical exercise. We know that that stimulates those good neurotransmitters, those feel-good neurochemicals um, that regulate our mood and also are the very same that are targeted by antidepressant medications. So exercise can also augment the effects or, or sort of enhance the effects of antidepressant treatment. One of my favorite researchers, Brené Brown, said, and I'll read her quote here, it says, connection is why we're here. We are hardwired to connect with others. It's what gives purpose and meaning to our lives. And without it, there is suffering. And I think we know this to be true. We are social beings at heart. So social isolation is one of the biggest risk factors for depression. And conversely, social connectedness is a really strong protective factor. So I encourage you to just lean in, lean into your relationships with your loved ones, your family, your friends and our community. And lastly, I just want to touch on the idea that when we engage in activities that bring us meaning and joy, it also stimulates those beautiful neurochemicals. It gives us a sense of purpose. It gives us a sense of psychological well-being and it is protective. So thank you for doing this sort of rapid paced, fast trot through late life depression and anxiety with me. Um, and I just at the risk of self promotion, but I just wanted to flag this that I am in the process of building a platform. It's an educational platform to empower families to navigate the aging journey with confidence. And we'll have topics such as late life depression and anxiety. So if you want to learn more, please go to talkingaging.com. Thank you. Thank you so much, Melissa. That was incredible. If you had to give three pieces of advice or three strategies to take away from this, if you're living with anxiety and depression or if you're caring for someone with anxiety or depression, what would you say are the takeaways? I think probably the most important is firstly the idea that it's not an inevitable part of ageing. Secondly, that there are very effective treatments available. And when I say treatment, I don't mean we can get you 20% better, we can get you 50% better. And I'd love to know Henry's thoughts on this, but 
really our aim is 100% better. We aim for cure when it comes to depression and anxiety. And I mean, there can be mitigating circumstances, but I would say that that is the sort of overarching sort of aim of treatment. Um, and the third is to just please go to your GP. And if for whatever reason you feel that, that you're not able to discuss these themes with your GP, don't hesitate to seek a second opinion. I promise they are so familiar with this. You are not the first person, you won't be the last. So please reach out for help would be my biggest takeaway. Thank you so much. Well, we're very fortunate at Monty. Our staff are actually trained in doing mental health screens. So that helps a lot with identification and, and assessment. Um, and we actually have an on-staff clinical psychologist two days a week, and she offers um, short, structured, short-term, evidence-based therapy, um, which is incredible. We're really lucky to have that resource. Um, our social workers provide emotional support, and we follow evidence-based strategies, again, to promote mental health, such as exercise, social connection, diversional therapy, meaningful and purposeful activities. Um, and speaking about the blue zones this is something Mel and I were speaking about earlier today and we tend to just go on rants and have incredible conversations but you know speaking of the blue zones they're five places in the world where people just tend to live for longer periods of time their longevity is like I think they live past 100 years of age and they live well and one of the things that they all seem these areas seem to all have in common is spirituality and it's interesting that you know Monty offers obviously um, Judaism which is fantastic and celebrating the holidays there must be something special about religion because I think it provides a sense of purpose a sense of structure social connectedness and also a sense of belonging um, so yeah I think I think it's a it's a great attribute to to living well um, and it's so interesting what you were saying about the lipstick test as well, Mel, and I think it just goes to show how important it is to actually know your people, know your family, know your friends, know your patients, know your residents, and that really is the cornerstone to person-centred care, which we promote and, and live out through Monty. So I'm really glad you mentioned that. And it's isn't it interesting? It's such a gut feeling that you get when someone is unwell, but then when someone is better. Thank you so much for that. Um, we do have a few questions that I'd like to put forward. I mean, one of the themes that seems to be coming up quite a bit is sleep. Henry, I don't know um, if you'd be happy to answer this, but someone yeah. said, does the sleep oh. need to be in one block? For example, if someone sleeps for four hours, they wake in the night and then they go back to sleep again for three hours or two hours later. Um. There's no evidence about whether one block or having it, <coughs> having it in two or three blocks makes a difference. So most of the study is just looking at the number of hours. So um, I don't think there's uh, any reason to believe if you're getting your hours in two blocks, it's going to make a difference. Most people, when they get older, have to get up once during the night, at least, um, to go to the toilet. And then uh, mostly they fall back asleep. Sometimes they need a bit of time. But I, I wouldn't get concerned about this. And remember what I talked about, relative risk and absolute risk. Just because someone's anxious or someone's having poor sleep doesn't mean they're going to get dementia. There may be a small percentage increase in that risk of dementia. And you just have to remember that when we're um, in our 70s, the risk may be about 10, 15% or 10%, let's say. Over 80 is 20%. That's all people over 80 and all people over 90 are 30%. So, um, you know, if you increase that risk to 32% or 34%, I wouldn't lose sleep over it. Pun intended. Yeah. Someone else said, do you think that elderly people who can't sleep should seek help? See, all these, these risk factors are observational studies. What we don't have is treatment studies. We know, for example, people with low vitamin D have more cognitive problems, but there's never any evidence that taking vitamin D makes a scrap of difference. There's no evidence that taking that um, improving your anxiety, um, getting expert treatment from Melissa, for example, would reduce your risk of dementia. Um, logically, you think it would, but we don't have the studies to support that. 
Whereas with the hearing, people did look at people, and these are again naturalistic studies, you can't randomize people to take hearing aids or not take hearing aids. But the people who use the hearing aids may in fact be the more conscientious people, the people who exercise more, and there may be other factors associated with those who use hearing aids. So the gold standard is what they call a double blind randomized control trial, where you take one group of people, you don't do the intervention, like reducing anxiety or improving sleep or using hearing aids. You take another group of people where you do do it and you somehow make it so that the investigators, the researchers don't know who's in which group. And with the drug, you can disguise it. So the people in the trial don't know if they're getting the active drug or the placebo. Mm. With a lot of these risk factors, it's impossible. You can't do a, a, a randomized control trial of 20 years of a certain diet, you know. So uh, um, I, if you're anxious, though, why worry about the dementia part? Just go and get treatment. Why live with it when you can live a better life without anxiety? Or learn strategies to control it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Henry. Another question came through as well. Is amyloid beta confirmed as the cause of Alzheimer's? I remember reading some studies recently which suggested this may not be the causative factor as once thought. It, it, it's controversial. The, the, um, there are probably different sorts of Alzheimer's to make it even more complicated. There's uh, about 1% of Alzheimer's where it's clearly highly genetic. It's autosomal dominant. So if a person has it, they'll pass it on to 50% of their children. And if a person has the gene, they will develop it. It usually comes on in the 40s and 50s. And for these people, they can identify what's going wrong, why the gene that they have is doing it, and it has to do with making more of this amyloid beta protein. But for the other 99%, it's mainly a late onset disease. And we probably all make some of this A beta, this toxic protein, and we clear it from our brain, like in our sleep. And some of us are more efficient and some less efficient. Now, what the argument about is whether the amyloid beta protein that accumulates is the primary cause or just something else that goes wrong and there's something further upstream. So there have been 30 years of drug trials and no convincing evidence up until two months ago, three months ago, that it's making any difference. Now, in this audience, I presume many of you, most of you may be older, a third of us will have amyloid beta protein in our brain. These are people normal in the population. They don't have dementia and they may never, they are at increased risk for it, but they may never develop clinical dementia. So amyloid may be the wrong target. And there are a number of people who say, we're spending billions, not millions, but billions of dollars chasing this elusive amyloid beta protein, we may be looking in the wrong place. Mm. So um, it, it's a great question and the controversy, it's definitely a player. And there may be a chain of events, maybe this is the weakest link and we can attack it. But it's clear there are other things happening as well. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Someone also said, um, asked, given that anxiety could be associated with a diagnosis of dementia, do you recommend an early diagnosis or would you recommend someone with signs of memory loss, for example, wait until these symptoms become more prominent or worse? Maybe Melissa should have a turn of answering this. Oh, well, Henry, I hope we're in alignment here, but I, I intuitively feel that we probably are. I would always advocate an early diagnosis. <laughs> so I learned this in my own family and I've seen it in my, my clients, my patients, that so for, I have a few thoughts here. So the first thing is, I think getting a diagnosis, yes, it is distressing. Um, but having said that, it also comes with opportunities. And I just want to talk through some of those opportunities. <laughs> the most important opportunity is the gift of time and planning. So avoiding the diagnosis of dementia, avoiding the, the term, the, the sort of label for want of a better word, doesn't help you to avoid the disease often all it does is sort of deprive you of time to implement healthy brain aging interventions, other interventions to help you live well with dementia. Um, 
And often you, if you then reach out later, particularly as I've seen, if it's a crisis point, your options for really practical things like care and, um, and allied health interventions become limited because you're pressed for time and choice. Um, but I also found in my Zeta, for example, and in many of my clients that having a diagnosis of dementia can also be as much as it's devastating, it can also be really validating. It allows you to put language to your experience. For my Zeta, it helped him to stop sort of second guessing whether these changes that he noticed in himself were real or not. Um, it also as a family for us allowed us to realign our priorities and in an odd way, his diagnosis of dementia in some way sort of enriched our family relationships because we were so acutely aware of the preciousness of time. Um, so yes, basically the short answer is I would always advocate please seek an early diagnosis. Uh, Melissa, we're in alignment. And, okay, uh, good. <laughs> I have seen patients who've said, what relief when they got yeah. the diagnosis. Because they said, I felt like I was running in mud. I just couldn't get anywhere. Now I know what's wrong. I can work out strategies. And I, I like your language, Melissa, you know, the gift of time. Because you can plan, you can compensate. If you have a stroke, you get rehabilitation. If you have dementia, you can do re-ablement, rehabilitation, yeah. like, a, like we were talking about earlier. So there is so much that people can do, <coughs> pardon me, to compensate. <coughs> It's, and it's interesting as well from a functional perspective. I think the earlier you know, the better you can be at laying down the foundations and setting yourself up for the future. It really is just such a powerful thing to have that information. Someone else came through with a question, and I'm going to take this to Henry because this looks medical. Is normal pressure hydrocephalus always associated with Alzheimer's? Normal pressure in hydrocephalus is not associated with Alzheimer's. It's a different sort of dementia. So what happens is we have fluid in our brain. We have in the middle of our brain, we have these cavities called ventricles, and uh, they make this fluid called the cerebrospinal fluid. It flows inside our brain and outside our brain and up and down our spinal cord. It provides like a shock absorber system. It also provides nutrients. Now, we keep making this and uh, as it goes up and down our spine and we can access that fluid by doing a lumbar puncture or spinal tap. And we can actually analyze the chemicals in, in that or, or cells in that fluid. But if there's some blockage in the brain, which stops the fluid from circulating, the pressure builds up in those cavities, those ventricles in the brain, and it pushes the brain to the sides. And we've got a, a solid skull here, this cranium, and there's nowhere for the brain to go. So it gets squashed. And as it gets squashed, there's more room and the pressure normalizes. That's why it's called normal pressure hydrocephalus. And it presents with classical triad, three symptoms. Problem with walking or ataxia, urinary incontinence and dementia. Mm. And if it's gotten early, and this, the picture on the scan is characteristic. You see these really big ventricles, but no shrinkage on the surface of the brain. Whereas in Alzheimer's, you get shrinkage all around the brain, the surface and on the inside. But they're putting a shunt in, like a little tube into the ventricle and letting it drain into a vein or you know, in, into another part of the body. It releases that pressure and people can improve. And sometimes they do a trial of just doing a lumbar puncture, just putting a needle in there, reducing that pressure and seeing if their walking improves. The earlier that's treated, the more likely it is to work. After about 12 months, the likelihood of success with the shunt diminishes. But I had a patient who was in her late 80s and she presented this way. She had a shunt and she, she was doing a PhD and she's back to doing her PhD. She's just amazing. Yeah. So it can be dramatic, but it can be disappointing, particularly if it's been going on for a long time. Thank you so much, Henry. Well, I think that's all in terms of questions. I'll give you back to Janine to finish off. Oh, you're on mute, Janine. Thank you, everyone. And I'm sure that you all agree that that was an outstanding and informative session. 
And I'd like to thank Henry, Melissa, and Eliza. And we really appreciate all the time, um, your selfless time that you give to us and to the community um, to be, give us these informative and expert, um, expert sessions. Um, thank you everybody for attending. We've, we were very pleased to have so many attendees and we'll be sending a recording of the seminar to you all via email and also share contact numbers and further information for Dementia Australia, Monty Health at Home or Residential Care, for advocacy groups and who, con and who to contact for next steps should your family need it. Thanks again for watching and see you all at our next Spotlight event in the coming months. Good night, everyone. <laughs>